David, there it is, recording in progress. So David, do you want to say anything first or just have Matt launch into his we'll presentation? Have Matt, jump right into it. Okay. Get to screen share here. Going full screen on a PDF, is that still visible? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, Matt Malik, Director of Public Works. Um, we're here tonight. Uh, I'm going to go over a, a traffic calming program that we're working to develop the city of Clayton. Um, we're going to go through a few different uh, phases of the program uh, and different steps. Um, right now, this is a Kind of just a working framework, if you will, from some uh, analysis I've done of different traffic calming programs uh, in the area uh, and even some outside the area. Uh, each one has different nuance, uh, different criteria, different approaches. Uh, and I'll try, we've tried to take those and combine those into something we think would fit in the city of Clayton uh, as a starting point uh, to begin a discussion. Uh, this is not meant to be a, a final document in any capacity. It's just um, what, what we think would maybe a good uh, first steps. Um, so the, the purpose is kind of twofold here. With the presentation, it's to gather feedback on this framework um, so that we can further refine this traffic pro calming program. Uh, and the program we'll get into, but will you know, give us a, a step process on how to address uh, one of the most common concerns we get, which is speeding in neighborhoods. So uh, the purpose of the, the program, which I just preempted myself there, was define that process, um, establish qualifying criteria for different levels of traffic calming measures. So um, sometimes those are physical, sometimes it's enforcement, sometimes it's education. Uh, there's, there's more than just um, installing something in the roadway. Uh, we look to utilize traffic calming measures to, you know, to reduce speeds and, and volumes where appropriate for acceptable levels. Uh, based on the street. Um, we want to use these measures to maintain maximum mobility and access for all users of the street as well. It's not just vehicles. Um, at each stage you'll see through here, it's, it's built in, but you know, the, the neighborhood involvement throughout each one of these stages will be important getting their feedback, whether it be um, they raise the issue to the city staff or they're voting on a particular issue perhaps, or some of, the, some of the ideas we came up with, or a particular solution, excuse me. Um, look, uh, how, how these get funded, the, you know, the procedure for the development of the project itself and how we go about getting the funds. And then the, uh, if for some reason it's not working out whether staff identifies it or the residents are not liking it, how are we gonna evaluate that and what would it take to remove it if some some reason it's the nobody likes it anymore? <laughs> hey, Matt, really quickly, if I don't mean to interrupt, but if you could go back to that last slide, just because I, I think it would be helpful, could you give a quick one minute explanation of what the functional classification of a street is? So sure. that's something that will come up through this conversation. I just want to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, I'm trying to get. To, I got maps here somewhere. Oh, you know where it's at. So functional classification is given by East West Gateway. Um, that based on the amount of volume uh, the roadway carries, it um, and usually the speed limit is higher on these roads. They have different functional classifications. So you you'll see here. This is a map published by East West Gateway. So within the city of Clayton, you know we have obviously 170, which runs through the city, but primarily what we deal with are um, arterials and major and minor collectors. These routes carry usually thousands of vehicles per day, um, usually have a speed limit of 35 miles per hour or more, and um, are not generally suitable for um, trying to slow traffic down because it would lead to congestion issues. So whenever we go since we're here, whenever we go to try to get grants from East West Gateway, these are the only streets that are eligible for grants um, is another way these are utilized. So you'll see in the downtown area, 
Um, sorry, as I zoom in, the lines get a little thinner, but almost all the streets, with the exception of Condolet, are uh, you get you can zoom out Y down would be one of those routes um, that is a major collector, so it feeds into other residential areas. Then as you go up Forsyth, up Merrimack, and out Forsyth to the east. Uh, but those are generally based on the amount of volume that, that road carries. Great, thank you. So Matt, just- Unless there are questions. Just Matt, so all those other streets, all the side streets, they would not be eligible for any funding then? Correct. It's so just side here, streets. It's just I major here. roads. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. Not through East West Gateway. There may be other programs that occasionally, depending on like if you were going to put um, maybe some kind of pedestrian facility that would maybe cut through an area, but generally just to, for the maintenance of those streets, they are not eligible. Okay. But your, your criteria that you're talking about would apply to any any streets that we, we consider needing a calming measure. Yeah, we lay out some criteria that identify some streets that on just by way of the program would be exempt that I'll, I'll try to cover. Okay. But, um, you know, the idea, like many things, we'd, we'd want to be able to look at each situation on a case by case and be able to have the flexibility. A program is a, you know, it's a guiding framework, yeah. I guess, but you can always um, make individuals uh, determinations. Thank you, Matt. So the, the process we've kind of come up with at this point is um, uh, we're going to go through each stage on the next few slides, but the way we kind of see this working, and again, we'll still need some refinement because I see some scenarios that I'm like, oh, okay, what are we going to do here? Uh, and we, we can work that out in the final policy, our program, excuse me. But the, the request could initiate with an individual or uh, a group. Um, it's good to get the, the HOAs were, uh, were applicable involved um, and it'll involve the police department, public works and the alderman of the ward. Uh, they'll at least be notified. Usually on the, uh, the police and public works side, we're involved in some capacity of the, the initial steps. Um, so the, what we've outlined, the program has three stages. Um, the, the concern, depending on how it's presented to the city uh, or if the city identifies it, doesn't have to just be generated by the residents. Um, could will enter at stage one or two, um, and from there we'll determine uh, how we proceed forward. Um, so based on that request, as we get into these stages, you'll see there's impacted areas that are identified. So as we get these requests, we will look at the area that may be impacted if we were to, to do some kind of installation, uh, a permanent installation, and make sure we identify those properties so that as the, uh, the residents are looking to uh, get, get support or um, discuss with their neighbors uh, the ultimate design, they would have a list of those properties. Uh, and also outlines who would be doing any uh, involved in the petitions or the voting. Uh, the neighborhood involvement is uh, included in each stage. So it can include meetings to you know, get to the heart of what the issue is uh, the surveys, uh, and et cetera. So implementation of a permanent traffic control measure um, is subject to the final stage and funding availability. So a, a permanent measure would be something that uh, there's a design for, there's a construction cost for, and there would be an alteration uh, in the roadway, generally in the roadway. And then, you know, just, uh, you know, if, if at any point it's determined that it's not in the, in the best interest uh, to proceed with a certain installation or a certain measure at a certain place. Um, it's a, you know, emergency responders, the city have, we'll be getting input from them. So if, if there's anything that comes up that would, we think cause an issue, you know, there's the ability to take a step back, look at it and say, okay, it's not, it's not right in this location, regardless of, you know, where we're at in the process. So st stages of traffic calming, um, these kind of mimic what we do now to an extent, but uh, just to hopefully formalize um, and really focus the efforts on when not just responding always to one request with a full traffic study, but getting um, 
some support in the area to identify that there is an issue before putting uh, a lot of staff time behind trying to come up with a solution. So uh, goal one is just if we had a, a single resident concern in an area. So we, we, would, um, we would look to do a few things. Uh, a lot of this would involve input from the police department, which is what we, what we do now. So it would be enforcement of the posted speed limits. We might have installation of the speed trailer um, or the signs which are installed that run in the stealth mode as well as the on mode. And then utilize whether it be social media, um, reaching out to the trustees, but some kind of public service announcements. Because many times it, a lot of the people driving through the streets are the residents. So being able to reach out to them directly uh, through one of those avenues would be good. So if uh, beyond stage one, um, we're still seeing, okay, uh, there still seems to be an issue. The resident could petition the surrounding area, so within 500 foot, um, and get support letter from the HOA, again, applicable. Um, this would trigger stage two, which would involve a potential variety of things. A lot of them look like what we do now with the collection of the data and the analysis um, of the speeds, the volumes. We'd review the crash history. Uh, we'd meet with the residents to see what the, the true uh, issue they're seeing is and see if there's anything else that needs to be considered. Um, as part of this is um, getting to those criteria that Alderman Lentz was mentioned earlier, um, that we'd evaluate these projects against. So once we've collected some of that information, um, we would look at these next four bullet points and see if it would qualify um, for moving on to the next stage. So it would be primarily a residential street with a posted speed limit of 25 miles per hour or less. Uh, 85th percentile speeds would be five miles per hour beyond the posted speed limit. So in our areas, a majority of our speed limits are at 20, but we do have some Clayton Gardens, um, I think some old town that are posted at 25 as far as public areas. An average daily traffic of 300 to 2,000 vehicles per day. Hey Matt, and, uh, Matt, can I ask you, sure. why does it matter how many vehicles there are if the issue is whether they're speeding? So if you have only 100 vehicles in a day, but every one of those vehicles is speeding through mm -hmm. that neighborhood, I'm just wanting to know, Wouldn't I mean, how does the number of vehicles why is that an important factor? Well, it, it could be from just the, um, the, the perspective of funding is limited on for such activities, uh, focusing it where it's gonna have the most benefit. Mm -hmm. um, also, if, if, it's, if it's that low of a volume, the, the impact overall, if you, if you have a road where 700 people are speeding, um, like the 85th percentile speed is seven miles per hour over the speed limit you're having a lot more impact than a road. Some roads we've got with like 120 average vehicles per day where that might be seven cars. So not to say that a speeding car isn't dangerous in each situation, but you're certainly having a lot more impact um, on those roads that have a much higher ADT. And again, this is with this would be something we could evaluate as the program development happens, but a lot of these programs do have minimum and maximums um, for those type of reasons, but there's there's still flexibility that could be accomplished. But okay, all right, thanks. Yep. And then uh, we talked a little bit already. The arterials, the major collectors, which were the for Clayton, the, the streets that were on that map that we looked at, and then primary emergency response routes uh, would not be eligible. So the primary emergency response routes really involve um, a few select routes a lot of them are in the downtown area uh, and wouldn't be something that would uh, probably get this kind of attention anyway and they already have higher traffic volumes but um, sections of bonham brentwood carondelet in the downtown uh, maryland avenue uh, oh there's a list at the bottom excuse me i don't have to read it all off to you but uh, this was collected, it looks like about 10 years ago, internally we went through a process of beginning to put a program together, but it was never finalized. Um, and these routes were ones that were identified in that program. Um, I as we work to develop this further, I, I check those 
with uh, police and fire to confirm them, but those were our identified emergency routes at that time. So once we've collected that data and compared it against um, the qualifying criteria, we'd share that with the, the resident group. Um, the, the PD could do enhanced enforcement of posted speed limits. And, and again, these are activities that may be included, but uh, aren't necessarily we we're going to do all of them in every situation, or doesn't mean we can't add something to it as well. Um, so we could consider installation of temporary low cost measures to see if the next step we would take would be um, something that would yield results. So whether it be we install some planters or some uh, cheaper pylons before we would go installing uh, curb lines. Um, if we did install sense measures, we could, you know, again, install counters to determine the effectiveness. And then if, if levels begin to fall, depending on what we did to have those levels fall, we could evaluate it. Um, if through enhanced enforcements, we see levels fall, maybe we set a timeline where we, we revisit it or they do occasional enhanced enforcements or speed trailer. And we revisit it just with new counts and speed data to see, okay, it's still working or, okay, do we need to look at taking it to the next step. Matt, um, I have a question, just, just kind of following up on Ira's question. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, these criteria, qualifying mm -hmm. criteria that you have listed here, those are, are those criteria um, something we're, we're going to discuss and decide what the criteria are? Are these the criteria that you are basically recommending? I think it's going to be a combination of both. I, from looking at um, other programs, these uh, are common criteria. Um, I think I, I looked at um, the five mile per hour beyond the posted speed limit is a pretty common one. The average speed limit or the average speed three miles per hour beyond is something I've kind of looked at adding. The ADT, there's a little variation in that with other programs, but uh, the idea, whether it be this evening, future meetings is collecting some of that feedback on these things from you all as we look to develop this. It's not going to, I don't picture walking away from this and finalizing this report tomorrow, but right. um, this was a kind of an initial um, step based on what I think would fit the city. Well, so just for frame of reference, I, I don't recall, what is the ADT on some of our neighborhood streets? Any, anyone, Crestwood? Audubon, uh, any, you know, any examples that you remember? Sure. So if we take a look at our, this is a traffic count map we have posted on our website and I went through and just put some rough numbers on it here. Um, I will zoom in closer. I see some people leaning in. Um, <laughs> if you see a white box, that is a number that's probably older than 2017, I believe is the date. If you see a yellow box, it was taken from probably in the last four to five years, just a newer traffic count is all it is. So if we look at a Crestwood, uh, and this is traffic in both directions, um, we are looking at 900, average, average daily traffic is ADT, so 940 vehicles per day down by Clayton Road. Um, as you pass Claverack, it goes to 820. At the north end up by Y down, you're at 610 vehicles per day. Um, wow. You get on the east side over here at Ridgemore, you know, you're at 310 down in the Moorlands, that like Clayton Road, you vary from 1500 down to 610. Um, uh, for just a comparison's sake, let's go up in the north end of town, a Forsyth, as you pass Kingsbury, is 2,750 cars per day. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next step beyond uh, stage two would be stage three. So that'd be, again, uh, resident petition with 67% uh, um, support within a thousand foot of the area. Now this thousand foot, um, we would generally look at that and restrict that to the neighborhood is my thought. So you might have somebody on um, an auto bond that backs up to Claverack, but they don't use that as their primary route of access. So it's not gonna have an impact to them directly getting to their home. 
then they may be excluded from that. So it's not just a thousand foot circle necessarily. We'd have to look at that. Uh, but if it would be on a route that a home might be 2000 foot away, but that's their primary access, they may be included as the, the interested area as well, included with the interested area. Um, so this stage would be, again, another meeting as needed with residents uh, to discuss potential measures that could be installed. Um, we'd review the data from stage two, try to come up with a, um, a plan, a consensus amongst the residents and uh, some estimates for these. Now we may come up with one plan, two plans. Um, it, it depends, some things might lend themselves better to certain situations where other areas might only have one thing that, that makes sense. And while I didn't put together a, a toolbox of implementations here that we would utilize, there are a number of traffic calming measures out there, um, but a lot of areas don't look to draw from the, the 20 or so measures that are out there. They, they try to keep it somewhat simple so that uh, motorists and residents know what to expect. So you might, you might see yourself drawing on a, a typical three or four items so that there's some cohesion with it, but nothing says you have to do it that way, but I've seen with other, other areas. Um, so once those recommendations would be developed, we would um, put that out to, uh, like we've, we think we've met with the resident group, we've come up with some designs, put that out to the, the residents for a vote. Um, again, the same area with the 67% would, would agree on the, um, the, the traffic calming measure and that would have us a project that would be identified. Um, so from there, we'd move on to funding and implementation. Uh, different cities have different ways that they do this. Um, some devote a certain budgeted line item to it, I, I guess, annually. And you could um, rank projects within that to receive this. Um, we weren't sure just yet on the, the best way to proceed with that. But I, I think the way it would break down, at least initially, would be um, depending on the cost associated uh, to install the measure. So a lower cost project, um, I might refine this dollar amount more, but if it's under $5,000, uh, staff would provide a recommendation to the city manager for approval into the current budget as it allows or inclusion in the next budget. Um, other projects that um, go kind of beyond those dollar values and get into moving curb lines around and really get higher costs, um, we would share that with the board for approval as part of the annual budget or it becomes a capital project in some cases. Um, yeah. Following the installation of such project, the, um, the traffic calming, we'd look to evaluate it between six and 18 months. Um, the idea being we would want to get the counts and speeds roughly the same time as we took them prior to installation but still give it time to get up and be functioning. Um, after that newness wears off, if you will, anytime we put up a new sign, you put up a speed trailer, people pay attention for a while and then it kind of fades. So get past that, uh, that period and then still collect the data in roughly the same time. Um, a lot of programs I uh, reviewed had re criteria for removing uh, such installations. Um, I guess it uh, might happen quite quite often, whether it be people turn over in an area or they just decide they don't like it. So um, the initial uh, request would be two years or greater from the date of the implementation. Um, it would be considered. So it would need to follow our evaluation too. And then uh, the similar process for bringing it about, uh, residents submit a, a petition for its removal. Um, once we check that petition, we would reach out to the affected area and then require a 67% vote for removal, same way as implementation. And then if um, a traffic coming device is removed, generally we would set a timeline for, okay, we're not gonna go through the process again, starting in three months. So at this case, we put um, two years following the date of the removal. And, and Matt, just like with the, um... Uh, the uh, request process, the approval process, um, 
the removal would also be subject to the city agreeing to it. And that the city in its discretion could say, we're not gonna remove it. We think it's important or for whatever reason. In, in any of this situation along the way, we're not, um, we're not seeking um, approval like we would on an, an easement or on somebody's property. We're all within city right away here. Yeah. So it's always up to the city to act in its best interest. So next steps beyond this, um, I know it's high level kind of framework, but really looking to see um, any real red flags raised or things that people thought that we should take and investigate further as we as we refine this. Um, you know, we're going to go back and get probably a few more heads together, get with police and fire as we work to refine this um, and get a program that we can bring, bring back or share with you uh, for review uh, in the future. So that's really kind of uh, all I had in the way of uh, prepared materials, but welcome to take thoughts or questions. Um, I, oh, go ahead, Susan. Um, just a few. Uh, first of all, so this is really um, citizen initiated traffic calling. The city will still continue to try to do the cohesive around the city, right? This is really addressing if a neighborhood wants something done. Yeah, this, this doesn't, um, this is not meant to take the place of like a complete streets policy or anything that we might do on our own as part of a project or anything that we've identified. If we, if the police were to come to us and say, hey, we're having a lot of accident issues at this location, we look at it, it's because of speeding. It doesn't have to initiate with a, a resident request. This would be the process for it. Okay, and it seems to, again, traffic calming isn't looking at really stopping cut throughs. It's looking at slowing down the people who are going to be in the neighborhood regardless. So you're not reducing, you're not looking at reducing traffic on any streets through, this, through these efforts really, is that right? Well, it's, it's not what we've, um, it's not traditionally the, the complaints I guess we get, not that we don't. Um, we would utilize these measures to, to do both, but the primary criteria we've established are based on speed. Right, I, I guess I ask that because um, the, you know, the comprehensive planning is so important because if, if, there, if there's a problem in one neighborhood and, and neighbors get together and something is done, the traffic's going to be pushed somewhere else if it's, if it's stopping cut throughs. And so it's got to be not just one group of neighbors wanting something, it has to look at the, you know, the, the consequences of that, where else it goes. So I, I hope that um, that's something considered in looking at these steps. Um, something else I wondered as well, if let's just say, and again, it's looking at the comprehensiveness of it, if, Let's say there was something like, I don't know, a bike path going through a bunch of neighborhoods and one area didn't want the path there. And so they were objecting under one you know, under these types of processes. Um, again, my understanding is this is in addition to what the city is going to be doing anyway to keep a comprehensive flow of pedestrians and bikes and cars going to the main arteries and everything else, right? Yeah, I, I wouldn't picture this as being utilized in any fashion to um, uh, remove or alter things that are installed under any kind of master plan or removal of a bike lane or anything along those lines. This would just be done as a way to hopefully not divert the traffic because there are measures that close down intersections or make them right turn only. Um, so it's half closures. That can do what you said. It causes people to go to the other routes. The idea would be you make the at least my perspective is you make it enough of a traffic calming measure that it slightly slows people, but it doesn't make them go to another street or seek alternate routes. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't picture um, removing a bike lane on a road to install a traffic calming measure. Yeah, and, I, and I guess that's the, the main, the, the main issue that, that, I, that I hope this addresses is that when you're looking at a neighborhood, I, I love addressing neighborhood concerns. I think that's, that's something that we need and will be really helpful. Um, but also that's just that criteria of looking at the effect it has on, on, on the, the next street over. Um, because we don't just want to move, move around the people who are speeding through to, to avoid a stop sign or a bump out or something else. Yeah, and I think that's where we could further define that impacted area. Okay. Uh, and whether it's part of the group or not, but when we're defining that impacted area, considerations 
when, when defining it. But we're certainly cognizant of that when we look at, uh, we've discussed these in the past, the, the, just pushing the, the problem to another street so that you move over and you do the same process on the next block that felt the repercussions of such a, uh, such a change is, is something we'd want to avoid for sure. Thank you. Bridget, did you have a comment? I was just, Matt, so then stage three anticipates any sort of different traffic calming measures. So it could be as extreme as a, you know, a permanent bump out, or it could be a stop sign, or it could be as simple as temporary posts or planters, right? Is that, <clears throat> is that what I would am understanding? That if it makes it to stage three, it could be any number of it, yeah, it could measures. be it could be anything. If if we get to stage three and we determine enhanced traffic enforcements are the way to go as opposed to installing something that restricts traffic. Um, the only thing I would say there is a stop sign would not be in the tool of traffic calming measures or yeah. during the last presentation. No, that's yeah, that what I was actually gonna ask Matt was like if you could um I'd be interested, and I don't know if this happened at some point before I was on the board maybe, or but um, I've read a little bit about this myself and I know sometimes people think stop signs are, and we've heard residents say that, but according to the folks that study this, um, like actually define to us like what is traffic calming and what are examples of traffic calming measures like we've talked about the bump outs I've seen stuff where it's just even like painting in the intersection or mm -hmm. um different like there's I know that there's like a wide variety of approaches and I don't know how many of them are um actually like recommended by traffic engineers <laughs> which I'm sure you would let us know um because some of them are even kind of wacky frankly um that are designed to you know like get a driver's attention or almost like startle a driver so that they slow down so um sure. that yeah, would be really there are helpful different... for all of us to understand thanks and there are many different um things you can do to whether it's vertical, horizontal deflections. This is the example I have up on screen here, which may be difficult to see, but it's Kirkwood's. Um, uh, they had Alta put this together. I don't know how much money they spent on it, but it does have nice graphics and goes through some nice um, um, different measures. So the, a choker, I, I can send, and we will develop these and identify these as part of the program. And I can share some information um, as we're doing that as well. Um, I will say on some of the streets, that we have some of the uh, toolbox items identified for traffic calming are narrower streets, on-street parking. We've, we've got quite a bit of that on a lot of our streets. Um, we can't do things like traffic circles due to uh, the right-of-way width restrictions. Um, but there are, there are different things that we can, could utilize. And some have really high price tags. Some of them have smaller price tags. Um, and I think I would imagine once we get further into this and if we get to the point of implementing a few, we'll, we'll settle on some that, okay, this fits us better and is a, a good bang for the buck, I guess, if you will. Like RRFB, there's, we've been actually installed one of those up um, on the north side of Shaw Park. Um, so that's an example of something that can be utilized in certain situations as well. If I add one more thing, and I, I hesitate because I know it's so anecdotal, but I was in Chicago last weekend and in the neighborhoods, and we did a lot of strolling, and there was a pretty much, it's an old neighborhood, so maybe this is outdated, but there's a pretty much a four-way stop on almost every corner, and it may well have been, and it was quite delightful to stroll, um, but it may well have been to keep traffic com from cutting through from the arteries, it, but um it, it did keep the neighborhood very calm and a lot of people outside and on the streets up there. So, I don't know. Yeah. I'll I, certainly defer to your expertise. <laughs> well, yeah, and we, that's what we want to do for sure. But, um, you know, I guess it would be great, and maybe you've done this already, but maybe to just reiterate why a stop sign is not traffic calming. If somebody has to slow down and stop, um, it, it sort of defies logic that it's not traffic calming. So I, I know we've got some people listening in tonight as well. 
I wonder if you could just address that. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, I don't have to open up what I had before, but um, so the, the, the purpose of the stop sign at the intersections um, are to control the right of way, to control the users of the intersection. Um, the, I get into anagram soup here, but the Federal Highway Administration is the, the body that dictates a lot of uh, different standards. Um, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices uh, is a standard that all states follow in some capacity. Um, specifically states that it's not to be used for speed control. So the manual that dictates all this says, if you're trying to solve a speeding issue, you should not use this. Um, you, ha you have the, the drawback of people will speed up um, beyond the stop sign thinking that they, if you, you stop at a stop sign that the feel is unwarranted, um, you feel that I need to make that time up. There are studies that show people speed up once they get 100 foot or so beyond the stop sign and coming up to it. Um, it can give a false sense of security because the stop signs like that are rolled through more often than not because they are unwarranted and people are thinking that cars are going to stop. Um, I, I've, I've not fully read them, but there are studies that show that um, it increases rear end collisions. Uh, so vehicle on vehicle uh, collisions. Um, there's a, it will push similar to a traffic calming device um, that was really restrictive. It could push traffic to a, another street as well. Um, I'm sure I'm blanking on some of the, some of the reasonings, but that's um, that's a few of the points. Certainly seems logical to me that the safest flow of traffic is a steady, safe speed rather than stop and go. That, um, as you said, could be um, people don't know if they're going to actually stop or not. They're speeding. They're back. They're hitting people in the rear end. Whatever. But uh, a steady constant safe speed would be uh, a, the, the goal, it seems to me, of traffic calming. Yeah, and the, uh, the, the other things with, with the stop signs, regardless of where they are, you have the, the, the added noise, the added pollution uh, that, that goes along with those. And 85th percentile speed, which I know we've discussed before, uh, was a way that if you look at a highway, not saying that it's used everywhere or it's appropriate in all situations, but if you look at a highway, the, the, the thing that's really unsafe about a highway is cars traveling at different speeds. Obviously the speed you're going at, but if you get a lot of cars traveling at a wide variety of speeds, that is when it can become dangerous. So establishing that speed limit on a highway as close to that range where most people are already traveling or, or, or trying to get, get them to group into that speed range is um, is a safety measure that's utilized on the highway. So yeah, that, that same concept would apply all of them. Matt, um, I, mean, I know you've done this, but when I drive just across Clayton Road from my neighborhood, I go right into Richmond Heights. And so let's take Boland, which is actually Crestwood going south. And any number of those streets over there um, just across Clayton Road, um, they do have a lot of stop signs. But the other thing they have are a lot of signs just asking people to slow down. Um, they have a, a bunch of different little slogans they use, but, you know, slow down, we love our town, some stuff like that. Um, I mean, those, are those considered, are those in the bucket of uh, traffic calming measures that in the toolkit that are options? Just curious. So I based on research that I've found, I will say that there are some cities that utilize those things. Um, vast majority do not. And being that it's installed in the right of way and in many times trying to mimic a regulatory street sign that's not a MUTSI compliant sign, we've not installed those. Um, there's, uh, I think, uh, oh, I can't remember if it was, Michigan or Tennessee, there were some cities I was running across where they did something like that. I, I, they're very few, but generally uh, those are not mutual compliance signs and we don't install them in the, in the right of way. Okay, but something like what you're showing on the screen are, are things that you think are um, possibilities? Yeah, those are standard uh, signage that 
regardless of where you would drive across the country, you would expect to, to see and know what it means. Um, this is a pedestrian crossing situation, but um, yeah, de depending on the, the scenario, we would look to MUTED for the appropriate signage. Okay. Any other comments from the board or questions? Um, yeah, I have a, I have a, just a, just a comment. So uh, Matt, have we employed uh, these kinds of traffic calming uh, things, you know, other than stop signs, have we employed that in areas of the city that you can point us to? Um, we, we've done some temporary measures that um, are not in place currently. I think we did some in Clayshire. Um, if you go on Davis Drive, we have one of the speed signs uh, that, that shows your speed as you go through uh, down the roadway. Um, we do have, as I mentioned earlier, while it's not something we went out and constructed, it's just by nature of, of, of being, we have on-street parking, we have the narrow road widths. Um, but as far as projects to go out and install, um, a lot of these devices you might see in this toolbox. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of different examples that I can point you to. Uh, in right. Clayton. Like, no, I can try the, to find some. The police department does put their trailer and they've got a, a radar sign on Y down. And mm -hmm. I think that's the police department doing that though, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, so that'd be one have, of those temporary measures. But, so we haven't, we haven't actually had a situation where a neighborhood has, has, has expressed interest in slowing down the traffic because there are speeders, you know, going, we haven't, we haven't yet been in a position where we've, we've tried other than stop signs, but we've tried, you know, these other measures, which might be narrowing or, you know, putting, putting other kinds of things in the way so that people will slow down. I just want to know if we have any of that yet in the city, if we've done it yet. Um, so in the downtown area, when the streetscape was installed and the bump outs were installed, be one example, um, that could be considered a traffic calming measure as it narrows the street as vehicles come to an intersection. But I, I believe the primary functionality of that was probably to shorten the pedestrian crossing as well. So I don't know what uh, the precipitous behind that coming to be, but that could certainly be something to point to in the downtown that could. Right, but do we have, but I would know. But my I question could, is, just, oh, go ahead, Becky, I'm sorry. Jump in, like in my own neighborhood in Hillcrest, we've had a group of residents who've um, engaged with the police department and public works on the topic of the speeding and concerns that they had and we've certainly seen responses, primarily the type of response we've gotten has, uh, or what we've done so far, I guess I should say, is the, um, the, the speed sign that draws your attention to how fast you are going. Um, and, and we've had those in, in and around Hillcrest for some time now, I feel like. And, and Hillcrest also just installed the speed tables just over the border in the city. So uh, that's, while it's in the city, um, we should be able to take some data as to whether it's doing any good in the, as soon as you get cross into Clayton. Right. Yeah, and I've asked our police and fire to you know evaluate those two and provide feedback. I've talked with Stan Mulvihill over there when uh, they were looking to install those as a, uh, as a trial, but they are, yeah, on Aberdeen and Arundel. Um, I think the, the quote I saw on those was about uh, a little over $4,000 each. I was wondering who was um, hogging those speed signs. I guess I know, now I know who. <laughs> no, they're, I mean, they're all over. They were, they're on our street periodically. I mean, the police department does a great job of responding to people when they complain. Well, we've, we've, had, we've tried to get one in White Down Forest. We had one for two days and then it disappeared. I haven't seen one since. It's been a year and a half, so. Um, that, that's, that's all, you know, I, and I think it would be good to have it on a lot of streets. I don't know that we have a lot of them, um, but I certainly think the data needs to be collected. And, and I, and my real question was, was if, if we've employed these measures, then do we have data that says, yes, it works. I mean, that's, that's really the crux of the question. So we don't have a lot of data in that. And that, that was part of, as I was going back and trying to draw on just speed and volume data. Um, you know, some of it is, is aged and um, we've been updating some of it as we go, but 
to lay out these criteria, you know, the collection of some some more data on the where we might expect to see issues would will be something we'll look at doing as well. But to go back and be able to say a, an A B versus a, a traffic calming measure we've installed before, uh, I don't have, uh, I can't think of a, a solid example. I guess I've got on that, but that's what the evaluation phase of this would hopefully provide. Mm -hmm even if it's for those temporary measures, like some planters to provide a, a narrowed roadway or something. Seems like you could, you could probably collect that data fairly quickly uh, after uh, installing whatever measure we use, right? We would probably let it ride for a little bit. Um, you At first, you'll get some artificially low numbers, I would imagine, from people that's something brand new, like whether they're looking at that sign that was installed or thinking, oh, am I going to fit through here or is it, uh, it going to be an issue? But as they get comfortable with it, they're going to get back to their speeds that they would normally drive at into the future. And so we, we wouldn't measure it the next week. We would wait a while. Um, so it, it would probably take a few months to collect that data, I would imagine. OK, good points. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm going to take you back to what, what I raised earlier about um, unintended, unintended consequences of if, if a if a measure is put in one neighborhood, what will happen? Maybe a couple of streets over. And I went back to what you said in the impacted area mm -hmm. and the way it talks about in process, that seems to be who's going to have voting rights and whether uh, they want the, the effort put in or not. And I just wonder if it would be helpful to add a bullet point looking at that, you know, broader impact. Is there a broader impact on surrounding, surrounding streets? So you get beyond that narrow impacted area. That's a good idea. I, I agree. Um, I don't know if any other board members have questions right now. We do have a question in the in the listening audience here that I would like to take if that's okay with everyone. Uh, Kathleen Gund has her hand up. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to respond to. Um, Ira's comment about uh, has this been used around the city in the past and um, I used to live on North Central and um, this is going back many many years but before the gates were put in or like they're not really gates they just kind of are like fake gates right north of the library um, the cut through traffic and the speed of that traffic was like the decrease in that was dramatic after those were put in. So that wasn't a stop sign. It was just like a narrowing of the street. So I just wanted to offer that. Um, I'm not sure if Matt was working in the city at that time, but I consider that uh, a traffic calming measure that while expensive was really effective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I wonder, I wonder if I can add a comment on that. You know, we talked about the Maryland Avenue and the bike paths, and I think that we we were we were also very interested in the fact that that we we I think we considered that as a traffic calming device as well. And so I'm 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 interested to see when we get those you know that street finished as to whether or not that happened. But I guess we need a before. I don't know that we have a before <clears throat> um, to get the after. Right. Do you know if we have anything, Matt, in terms of any yeah, we we've got something that would be. I think relatively recent enough, and then data from um, traffic studies from developments, while may not be in as much detail, I think we'll have good data that we can compare it against. But yeah, I, I, when you're as asking earlier, I was meant to say that while it's not yet complete here soon, knock on wood, um, that will be one that will serve as a traffic calming measure between Hanley and Forsyth. Right. Okay. Right. Um, one one real quick thing, which is um, Matt, we've still you know that sign you mentioned in Davis Place. I think it would be interesting to just do a measure on that to see if it's effective at this point because it's been there a while. So see if it slows people down. New counts. We, yeah. yeah, yeah. If yeah, we could do that, if you could, I think we've got that. We might as well look at it. Okay, it, it's actually after seven o'clock when we normally start a regular meeting. Um, I, we yeah. have, Sorry, Mayor, we have another yeah. hand up. I, I was just about to say that. Um, we do have one other hand, out, hand up. And so I'm going to take, let's take that. But um, I know it's Josh 
Josh Dubinsky. And Josh, I know that this is really important for you, but if you could be pretty brief, that would be great. Sure. And you know what, if it's not, if it's not appropriate for me to talk right now, I can wait till a more appropriate time. I know there's been a lot of time spent on, on this tonight. So um, <clears throat> if you'd like me to hold my comments until later, I can. Um, if you I, can I guess give it a couple of minutes and that's it, that would oh, work. Okay. Um, I just briefly in terms of, you know, the standards that are being used, um, which I, I believe Audubon, you know, fulfills those standards, um, just in general for the city, I think it's also important to evaluate the amount of miners that are living in a given area. So within a certain, whatever the parameters are for each stage, um, I think at some point there has to be a consideration for the amount of miners um, that are living in that area and then maybe taking, you know, extra precautions as needed, given that children are at risk and they don't understand right of way and cars need to travel at a reduced speed as a result with kids in the street. And um, I just think that's a, a factor that should be in play. Um, the second point I wanted to make was in terms of a stop sign, I understand the concerns. I understand that, you know, stop signs aren't always obeyed. People roll stop signs. Um, they can create conflicts in that regard. And maybe other stop signs can be ignored um, as a result of there being too many stop signs. Now, in the Moorlands area, you know, we see two stop signs on Westwood for six intersecting streets. We see three stop signs on Glenridge for seven intersecting streets. And on Audubon, we see only two stop signs for nine intersecting streets. So adding a stop sign where we're talking about at Cromwell um, isn't an excessive burden for the neighborhood. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's fitting with Glenridge. Um, actually, Audubon has more intersecting streets, so it seems like it'd be even more appropriate. Um, and then on Crestwood, you know, for the two inter intersecting streets that they have, there's there's stop signs at both of those intersections. So, you know, I, I think, you know, a stop sign has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. You just can't make a blanket, blanket statement that, no, stop sign's no good here because research, you know, shows in other areas that it doesn't work. So um, I will say that. And um, the, the other thing is um, in terms of doing chokers or doing chicanes, with our parking restrictions, I, I wonder if Mr. Malik could speak to how that would work with us having seasonal parking on either side of the street. And then we would certainly have to have no parking any time areas to accommodate the choked, uh, chokers or chicanes or the speed tables even, um, and how that, would, how that would look if we were to do something in that regard. I think we're going to have to ask, you know, um, Matt's going to come back to us with more ideas and, and more refined presentation based on the input tonight. And if Matt, if you could just keep that question with you and we'll, we'll you know, we, and address it at the next uh, go round because we are now almost 10 minutes past our meeting start time. And Mayor, I'd just like to say thank you and thank you to the board and thank you to Mr. Malik. I appreciate all the work that's being done on this and hopefully we can come up with a solution that can make our kids safe and make the residents in Audubon feel safe and something that will be effective to slow down traffic on our street. And thanks to all of you. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep, that's our goal. Okay, thank you so much, Matt. That was really thorough and great. Appreciate it. <clears throat> um, so I think we're good to go ahead and start the seven o'clock meeting. So I will go ahead and open that meeting. Welcome everyone. And uh, the first uh, order of business will be the roll call. Okay. Um, Alderman Lentz. Here. Alderman Berkowitz. Here. Alderman Mc McAndrew. Here. Alderwoman Buse. Here. Alderwoman Patel. Here. Alderman Fader. Here. Mayor Harris. Here. City Manager Gibson. Sorry, here. And City Attorney O'Keefe. Here. Thank you. Great. Um, the next 
Item is the approval of the minutes from September 28th. So could we have a motion? I will move to approve the minutes from September 28th. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's good. And now is the time in our agenda for public requests and petitions. And so if, if anyone's in our audience that has a topic they'd like to um, con you know, talk to us about that is not on our agenda tonight, now's the time. If you wanna raise your electronic hand, we will call on you. I'm looking at the list and I don't see anyone. So I think we're gonna move on. Um, well, the next item on our on our agenda is is really exciting. Um, is did somebody say something? Okay, so um, we are we are looking at um, or we're, we're I have a proclamation to make about the um, Filipino uh, American National Filipino Historical ho uh, Holiday. Um, but I just wanted to say in advance of reading it that we on the um, Commemorative Landscape Task Force have really been um, very interested and learned so much about this community through their representative that we've been in contact with. And she is in our listening audience tonight, Jana Langholz. Um, and Jana, I'm going to read the proclamation, but um, if you would like to say something after um, I, I, we would welcome any comments that you might have. Um, we, we know that we have a history of <clears throat> that intersects with the uh, Filipino community from the World's Fair. And um, of course, in more, more modern times, I, I know we have many community members that this will be very valuable to. So without further ado, I'm gonna read the proclamation. And then um, Jana, if you'd like to address our board in any way, we would welcome that. Um, okay. <coughs> Whereas the earliest documented Filipino presence in the continental United States was on October 18th, 1857, when the first <clears throat> Zones Indios set foot in Morro Bay, California on board the Manila built galleon ship Nuestra Senora de Esperanza. Yeah. And Jenna, I'm sure you're, I'm sure I'm butchering all these names, so sorry. Um, whereas the Filipino American National Historical Society has been observing October as Filipino American History Month since 1991, whereas US Congress recognized October as Filipino American History Month in the United States in 2009, 2010, and 2011. And whereas the Filipino American community is the second largest Asian American group in the United States, whereas Clayton is home to the Philippine Village historical site, which holds space for respectful engagement with history and, and the aftermath of the 1904 World's Fair with the perspectives of Filipinos and indigenous people at the forefront. Whereas Filipino Americans have played integral roles in the United States military healthcare system and have contributed greatly to music, dance, literature, education, business, journalism, sports, fashion, politics, and so many other uh, categories and so many other uh, initiatives uh, and fields that enrich the landscape of our country. And whereas Filipino American History Month is celebrated during the month of October, 2021, now, therefore, I, Michelle Harris, Mayor of Clayton, Missouri, hereby proclaim the month of October as Filipino American History Month in the city of Clayton. Jana, are you, uh, you, would you like to say anything to us? Um, we really appreciate all your input and uh, information that you have shared so far. And we all look forward to working with you to, to commemorate the um, Philippine Village Historical Site in a way that is that honors um, the community today. I think she's. I think she is sending us a chat. June, can you help me out with that? Okay, let me pull up her chat. Um, she's saying thank you very much to Mary Harris and the board. Maraming salams. I don't know what that means. It may be thank you in Philippine. 
Okay. All right. Okay. I think that's that's uh, that's Jenna's comment for now. I'm assuming. And Jenna, thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate your presence. Um, okay. So next on our agenda would be um, the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. The first item on here is the special obligation refunding bond, uh, bonds. The competitive bond sale occurred today at 10 a.m. and it was very successful. The city received bids from 12 bidders. The bids are evaluated based on the lowest true interest cost or TIC, which provides the city with the lowest cost of total debt service. The final sale amount was $5,010,000, which provided the city with $575,000 in savings over the remaining life of the bonds, which is $50,000 greater than the projected amount. The successful bidder was Fifth Third Securities Incorporated. The ordinance and exhibits have been updated to reflect the results of the sale. The ordinance will need to be amended for these changes prior to final vote to approve the sale of the bonds. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen amend the bill to the attached version labeled bill number 6864.1 and hold the second and final reading of an ordinance authorizing the sale, issuance, and delivery of special obligation refunding bonds, bonds in the amount of $5,010,000. And we do have Todd with Piper Sandler and uh, Mark Grimm with Gilmore Bell here to answer any questions you have. Um, if you have any about the sale. And, and Janet Watson, our Director of Finance and Administration, uh, can also answer questions. I know that they watched the sale as it happened this morning and it was quite exciting. And, and as I stated at the beginning, uh, was, was even more successful than, than we could have hoped. Any questions from the board? What was the expected amount that you were thinking they would sell for? The previous amount we had on here was uh, 525. We thought that was a good conservative amount. Okay. We, we thought that was the amount for the savings and then the prior estimate for the, uh, the total amount was 4,915,000. Okay. So the issuance was a little bit higher and the savings over the, the life of the bonds is about 50,000 more. That is terrific. Okay, any any questions? I have a technical one. Do I need to um, propose an amendment first? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Mr. Okay. Lins, it is an amendment by the text of Bill 6864.1. I don't need I don't need the actual amounts, do I? No, sir. Okay. All right. Well, I'll move to amend Bill six eight six four text to uh, uh, coincide with the sale of the bonds that it is that occurred today. All right. I'll second that. I'm not sure what he meant, but I'll second it. <laughs> I, I believe he meant to amend Bill six eight six four by the text of Bill six eight six four dot one. Ah, six four six dot one. And I'll, I'll, I'll second that one. Okay, <laughs> that's what I heard him say. And also to hold the second and final reading of the ordinance. That's next. Okay, I mean that's what you're recommending. Okay, um, all those in favor of amending the bill to aye. six four point one, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. Okay, then I will move to in introduce Bill 6864.1 to approve the ordinance authorizing the sale, issuance, and delivery of special obligation refunding bonds uh, in the amount of $5,010,000 to be read for the first time or second time? Second time, sir. Second time by title only. Second. Any discussion? All right. Uh, Mr. City Attorney. Bill number 6864 as amended by Bill 6864.1. Second reading and consideration for adoption, an ordinance authorizing and directing the issue and sale and delivery of special obligation refunding bonds, series 2021 of the city of Clayton, Missouri. 
and approving certain documents and authorizing certain other actions in connection therewith. Alderman Lentz. Aye. Alderman Berkowitz. Aye. Alderwoman McAndrew. Aye. Alderwoman Buse. Aye. Alderwoman Patel. Aye. Alderman Fader. Aye. Mayor Harris. Aye. Thank you. Okay, moving on to resolution uh, on the resolution on board norms and procedures, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. So the Board of Aldermen adopted a set of norms and procedures on November 27, 2007. The document outlined general standards, values, procedures for meetings and communications, and also defined the mayor's role. The current Board of Aldermen discussed and suggested revisions to the previously adopted norms and procedures at the retreat held on September 22, 2021. The updated document is attached and recommended for adoption by resolution. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve the attached resolution adopting the Board of Aldermen norms and procedures. And I will point out that there was one typo that was pointed out by Alderwoman Buse and that has been um, updated on our side. Thank you. Okay, we've identified our new typo person. <laughs> the last time we had a typo person was when Cindy Garnholz was on the board. So thank you very much. You are appointed. Um, yeah. Any any discussion? on this i i just i guess i'm just 2007 is when that was adopted I, I never even knew about it and i'm just kind of wondering what's the um what's the effect of of that i mean what what's i guess i want to know what's what's the point you know um, essentially, the board is just memorializing these these norms and procedures and, and adopting as a group this this set of protocols, so to speak, on how the board will operate. Um, and it's the board showing as a as a group that this is you know their commitment really to, to one another uh, and to the staff and how these communications uh, work between the board members. So my understanding is back in 2007, they took an, an action similar to what we're asking for tonight uh, and adopted this this set of norms and procedures, and it had been uh, just about 15 years since that was updated. And so that's why we went through that exercise at the retreat. Those changes are reflected here. Um, but outside of that, it, it really doesn't have any kind of uh, binding authority or anything like that. It's, it's really a set of more or less guiding principles for the board. So, um... and, and I do, and, and I should point out too, I, I do hand this out to every alderman uh, at the, every incoming alderman at the onboarding. Um, this yeah. was in a, in a file where it looks like this has been part of that onboarding process for mm -hmm. quite some time. Uh, and it was something that as I looked at it, and we had talked about different values, especially as it relates to DEI, sustainability, those types of things, those were incorporated here. And, and that's why uh, at the retreat, I thought it would be a good time to, to talk about this set of norms and procedures and potentially update it. Uh, but I do hand this out to every new elected official and stress the importance of this document. So, I would add, I would I was going to add as the newest board member that I, I actually found it very helpful. As much as I've been around City Hall, I found the, I found the, the list of items to be very constructive. Becky, did you have a comment for us, dear? Yeah, I just wanted to note that I did um, receive it when I onboarded um, and certainly glanced at it and we discussed it at the retreat. And what I would say is that um, I didn't understand it was something that we would like vote on, I guess. I mean, I hate to say I didn't take it seriously because I think the changes that we made, like I, uh, I'm i very comfortable with the changes that we made, I guess, for the most part. Um, but I guess I thought, I, what I, what occurs to me is that if I thought we were gonna be like, I guess voting on and formalizing it more, I think I would have considered a bit more time on it. Like there are some things that I think are uh, potentially still sort of like questionable or confusing, frankly. So I, I don't know though, like how much it's worth it to spend a lot of time on it either. I, I hate to say that again, but um, that's just kind of where I'm sitting. Like, I mean, I think even like the second 
thing under values. Like we talked about that at the retreat that there was a weird, a word there that we didn't like and we changed a word. But I mean, I would almost say like that isn't a value. Like just in terms of like how this is organized and, and items are categorized doesn't to me make a ton of sense. Um, so. I, I would I would say that um, I, like Ira, I've been on the board for a long time and have not, don't remember ever seeing this. Uh, on the other hand, we've had a number of retreats uh, prior to almost everyone, except maybe Michelle, uh, maybe Ira, you've been in a few of these where we've uh, actually talked through these things, not in the context of this document, but in the context of how we relate to each other. And I can say that one of the positive things is that the reason this document hasn't surfaced is because we do get along and we do practice these things. So I would say, no, do we need it? Uh, apparently not, at least not right now, but it's nice to have it and have it there. And um, it is how we operate. And let's just say we're all smart enough to know that's how we should operate and, and we're effective at it. <laughs> I will just, as the historian, I would just add, you know, um, when it was produced and uh, agreed upon in 2007, it was needed. <laughs> and um, so without going any further, I think there can be times when this, these guidelines can be brought out to remind people, hey, this is, this is kind of acceptable behavior and this is professional behavior for a board. Um, so I, I think it is important. I'm glad, David, that you're um, reviewing it with new folks. I, I think maybe your predecessor, maybe he didn't because I think Rich and Ira apparently did, haven't seen it. Uh, but um, it, it can, there can be situations, there can be board compositions where something like this is very valuable to have. Um, Becky, if you um, are taking it more seriously now, <laughs> Um, if you really feel strongly about some revisions, I think we can table it and you can, uh, you know, email some of your, you know, email your suggestions to us and then we can, you know, we can, we can move forward the next time. Or if, if it, you know, you can tell us what those suggestions are right now and we can um, amend it. Um, Whatever you're ready to do. Yeah, so I want to be clear that there really isn't there isn't anything that I like object to that would cause me to vote against approving these if we move forward with that vote tonight. So um, I'm uh, I'm not uncomfortable with any of them. I don't think like the one, the one that I thought was the weirdest is um, it says attend a commission board meeting occasionally to foster understanding and communication with resident members. And I thought that was confusing because we each sit on specific, as liaisons on specific commissions. And I don't think we should attend those occasionally. The expectation is to attend them all the time. And I don't know if the suggestion is that we drop in on others or if this was, if this was before a time when we had representation on all the commissions, that was the one that kind of jumped out at me the most as like, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna drop in on somebody else's commission unless there's really some hot topic. Like it's somebody else's like area to, you know? Um, I, so I don't know if, if there was a different intent there. Um, that was just one of only a couple examples that I thought were kind of, interesting i i honestly don't remember the the historic origins of that bullet yeah. point but i'm happy to take it out if other people i mean we could just strike it there's there is one about like attending the meetings that you are expected to attend yeah. which is to me is what matters i guess does anybody object to striking that bullet point no objection I have no objection, but I'm, I'm, my feeling is if if she's, Becky, if you've got other things, I'd rather we review it, table it and review it rather than, you know, pick, nitpick it, you know, yeah. one at a time. So there may be other things you have. I don't, I don't know. 
Well, yeah, I was just taking this to me, her comment to me, Becky, I was taking this to mean that this is the one you had singled out, but are there other things you would like to see changed? And if so, let's table it. Yeah, let's table it then. Okay, good. All right. Do we need a motion to table? I think. Yes, we do. Move to table. Do I move to table or just? Anyone can. Asking? Okay. Go ahead. Make the motion, Becky. <laughs> I don't want to step on your toes, but I don't want you to make the motion that I'm making. It's not, it's not on my script. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we table this for tonight. I'll second it. Any any discussion? Okay. All in favor of tabling, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Okay. Very good. So... Becky, I guess I would just ask if you could organize your thoughts on that and get it to David in time to work with us on any revision so at the next meeting we can turn this around. Okay. Thanks. Great. Sure. Thank you. Um, now we have the, the uh, destruction of records on our agenda. Yes, it is the recommended guideline of the Secretary of State to formally approve the disposition of records at the Board of Aldermen level and to include a list which describes the record series, including quantity to be disposed, the manner of destruction, and the destruction date. Staff is proposing to dispose closed 2019 traffic and 2017 municipal prosecutor files and police reports from the period between 2004 and 2009. Staff recommends that the Board of Aldermen approve a motion to dispose of the records listed in conformance with the Missouri Secretary of State General Records Retention Schedule. Any questions or comments from the audience? Any questions or comments from the board? Did he say 2019 traffic? Did you say that? I thought I heard that. It is 2019 yes. traffic, correct. 2019 traffic? These are 2019 traffic, these are the prosecutor's files for 2019 traffic. It's, it, seems, so it, seems, it seems a little recent. No, I mean, these sh should be items, and uh, let's we'll see if Chief's on here. Th these should be items I would think that are probably disposed of by the court. So the court itself would have a record. These are just the prosecutor files that would have gone along with those particular mm -hmm. cases. Um, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Or uh, June, you might have seen the actual files. Yes, um, I talked to the staff over in um, courts and uh, the police department, and we did confirm that according to the records retention schedule, they did qualify to be destroyed. And Chief, are these all cases that have been disposed of by the by the court itself? I, I would assume so, but I, I haven't talked. Uh, yes, they, yes, they are. I did get um, a document from TVB today. Uh, that showed the St. Louis County 21st Judicial Court had approved it. So, so if I wanted, if, if let's say we wanted to do some statistical analysis of 2019 to determine how the courts act has acted with regards to certain things, this would destroy that ability or do we have some record of this, whether it be on, you know, electronically or some other way? Do we have still a history of these things, even though the paper records are destroyed? The, the court will have that file. So the, there's, we have to keep the prosecutor files separate from the court files. And this is just the prosecutor set of files that are being disposed of today. This doesn't have any impact on the, the actual files that are kept within the municipal court. Okay, all right. And if, all right. So if we're doing this a detailed like analysis. The prosecutor took as they were working the case and stuff, but not that, necessarily the official I, record of the case. I would have. I would assume so. I've not personally looked at these files, but yeah. I, I would think that's what this is. It's just the prosecutor side of things. And I would imagine that uh, the, the prosecutor's findings or the prosecutor's summary, if there is one, would be attached to those court files that would still be maintained within our records. So there's, it, I, so as far as the any of the administrative entities that are saying this is okay, um, I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm just reminded, I know the Bar Association has their own rules about at what point in time you can destroy records of an attorney. And I don't know if they apply or not, but I would, does anybody know? That I don't know. I just follow what the state statutes um, was, um, records retention schedule is. Well, I think an attorney can destroy files with the client's consent, which is what's going on here. Oh, okay. All right, that's, that's how that works. That's fine. 
that's that's an assumption, Ira. But I mean, if the client consents to the disposition of the file, I can't imagine there's a bar rule that says I can't do it. Okay. I, no, it, it makes sense, Kevin. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. All right. Any other uh, discussion? Okay. Alderman Lintz. I move to approve the disposal of the records as listed in the board report. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. And then last on our agenda is the um, our, our meeting dates for the for 2022. Mr. Mayor, the 2022 Board of Aldermen meeting schedule can be found on page 77 of the meeting packet. And it requires approval prior to posting. We're recommending we're recommending that the Board of Aldermen approve by motion the 2022 Board of Aldermen meeting dates. Um, Mayor, can can I just comment here? And I apologize, June and David. I probably should have sent this message earlier, but um, you know, spring break is the week of March 22nd, 2022. And I, from a selfish perspective, I'm hoping we're not <laughs> on Zoom. And I want to be here for meetings. Also a good chunk of Clayton leaves town. So mm -hmm. is it possible to have the meetings March 15th and March 29th that month in order to facilitate? Uh, like, usually customary in the past, um, as we approach that date, then the board decides which date we'll have, a, you know, have the meeting on due to those types of um, events that come up. So I'm sorry, so I don't understand. So would, we wouldn't change it today then? Is I mean, that... we could if, if yes, we could. I'll just have to get the, my calendar out. And... Or what you're saying is we can wait until February or mm -hmm. something. Kind of we knowing can do it today that those of us it. who wanna travel can yes. maybe go ahead and plan travel then. Yes. And then we can figure out at the, as it gets closer, whether to move the date up or back or. Correct. Mm -hmm. I, would, your, I would agree with that with, the, uh, with waiting simply because uh, I think different schools have different dates of spring break. And so it's, um, you know, we never know what's really going on. No, I, I mean, I'm just talking about the Clayton School District and I, a lot of our people who are interested in our meetings are Clayton residents who send their kids to Clayton School District. I'm not talking about other private schools. I'm just talking about Clayton. So, yeah. I, I will. And then oh, two of us, two of us have school aged children in the Clayton I, I School. Well, and David, uh, David's oh, a third yeah. country. I, so. I will say this though, it, looking at the calendar, if we're going to move meetings during a month, March is a good one because right. March is yeah. one of those odd months where we have um, a plan commission meeting on the 7th. And then the next night we have a board of aldermen meeting on the 8th. And that repeats itself uh, later in the month on the 21st and the 22nd. So if we were to push that in any month, that's the one that probably makes the most sense because it's really nice to have those staggered a week apart so that we can get recommendations out uh, to the board and, and to the public, um, you know, with some advance notice there. So 15 and 29 would actually, it, it would work pretty well looking at the calendar here. It's just, it's the first time it's happened since I've been on the board where it's fallen during spring break. So that's all. I usually try to take a look when we um, mm -hmm. approve these meeting dates. So, mm -hmm. and we'll end up, you know, if it, if there are per important issues going on at that meeting and there are people, citizens who want to be involved, it's just going to kind of inhibit participation. So, because a lot of people leave town. I'll be out of town on the 15th, but can call in the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, we're, we're um, strategic partners with the school district. And so I think it's probably a good idea to go ahead and move it now. Okay. Um, I will add, though, that there's lots of, some people have kids in college and there's all kinds of schedules going on. But um, because we are collaborate with them so much, I think it's, this is a good, it's a good suggestion. Okay. So. Um, all right. So, so what's your preference, the 15th or the 29th? I think we're doing, we'd be doing both the 15th and the 29th instead of right. the. And June, I know you have scheduled vacation. I'm looking at my calendar here. 
on the 29th. We can work through that or have Andrea do the clerk duties. Yes. Uh -huh. um, just just from watching how things work with with plan commission rolling into a board meeting the, the next night. Um, my, I guess my recommendation would, would be to go with the 15th and 29th and keep them two weeks apart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. All right. Does that happen often where the plan commission meeting is the night right before the board meeting? It's going to happen a couple times a year, it seems. Sometimes because of a holiday, other times that, that first Monday of the month falls right next to the board of aldermen date, which is the second Tuesday of the month. And then yeah. we have those those meetings back to back. Um, and it is nice to have a little bit of separation between the, the plan commission and the board. I'm sure it is. Okay. All right. Um, I guess we need a motion for this. Um, I'll move to approve the 2022 Board of Eight Board of Aldermen meeting dates uh, with as amended with uh, March, the dates in March being March 15th and March 29th. I will second that. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, um, David, is there anything further on our business business agenda? There is not. And okay. no closed session tonight. Okay. Well, in that case, why don't we go around the computer screen and see if anybody would like to share anything that they've been up to. And we can start with Alderman Lintz. Um, well, thank you. Um, I'm just looking over my calendar and trying to find something that I've done. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, um, okay. I'm struggling. <laughs> okay, We can come back to you if, if no, you want. If it's hard to be think, first. I don't think I have any, anything to report that I, although I did that last week, last time we met, and I all of a sudden I realized I'd forgotten a, a big, big thing. But anyway, so no, I'll, I'll pass. Okay, uh, Alderman Berkowitz. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I had a, an ARB meeting as usual last week, and there was nothing on there except some things I could bore you with. And I think I, since I already experienced the boredom, I don't think it's worth passing that on to the rest of you. So I will pass on that. Um, uh, I'd just like to say to Janet Watson, I'm sorry I missed your party. To, and I was very, very busy, but I heard it was a bash. It was great. And um, anyone who was there, I hope you will all be happy to talk to me about what happened. So otherwise, what's that? It was very fun. Oh, good. Oh, good. Anyway, I will miss you big time, Janet. I mean, you've been amazing. Just absolutely fantastic. So I hope you don't I hope you don't lose touch with us yeah. on your way out. Okay. All right. uh, okay, great. Um, let's see who is next. Bridget. Um, I had a parks and rec meeting uh, last Monday, and we actually met um, in person outside for the first time in eighteen months. So that was really nice. We met in Enterprise Pavilion. Uh, and it was a nice night. Um, we got a great um, Justin, who's in charge of all the park maintenance and operations, um, did a fantastic job of just talking to us all about basically what it takes to keep our parks going. And it's tremendous what he does and what he does with um, the staff. I mean, I, I, every time Pat, every time I talk to Patty about something, she'll be like, oh, Justin can fix it. He can fix it. So um, but it was great to really hear from him and hear about all the different things he does just to keep um, our parks looking so wonderful. So um, it was a great presentation um, and it was nice to meet in person. Um, but he has a great maintenance, park maintenance and operations manual that's very detailed if anybody wants to see it. I'm sure Patty would pass it along. So, um, and I had a great time at Janet's um, party and um, Janet, I'll miss you so much. So when you did your finance, your last finance briefing tonight, I, in my head, I was like, oh, it's the last one, the last time we'll see her. So, or at Thank least you. on screen in a meeting. So. Thank you. Happy <laughs> retirement. Thank you. Okay. Um, Susan, 
Anything? Uh, I thank Bridget for that Parks and Rec report and Janet, uh, repeat all that and thank you so much and um, congratulations and the lunch was very fun. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Um, all right, Becky. Hi, thanks. Um, I just want to share that I went ahead and Googled Maraming Salamat and it means thank you very much in Tagalog. So thank you to our guests who shared that with us um, at the beginning of the meeting. Thanks. Mr. Fader. Uh, my, uh, my onboarding has continued with a, a terrific uh, uh, visit to our police headquarters. Laura Horowitz and I were taken around by Chief Smith and uh, he really did a terrific job. And finally, I'd be the last to say uh, also that uh, Janet did a great job, Janet Watson. And my first meeting of the non-uniform pension board, I never knew or wanted to know much about defined benefit plans, but I know a lot more after one hour with Janet and our consultant than I, I did before. And I actually think it might be interesting to be involved with it. So my, my best regards to Janet as well. Okay, I guess that leaves me. Um, I. I don't have a lot to report. I do want to, I can let you know that something that I did that was kind of fun. Um, I was the MC at the, get this, the Porsche Club, St. Louis Region Porsche Club annual car show. Actually, it's biannual. It's every other year. And they did it in downtown Clayton. And it was fun. They gave out some awards and there's some really beautiful cars that I got to see. Um, Quint, you know, there are a number of Clayton uh, residents that participated that I saw too. So that was, that was great. Um, and then oh, mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sure yeah. Dan would have been an active participant oh, in that. So right. I'm sure oh. they were talking to you about him. Cause he, I know he was involved in that club. So I believe he was on the a longstanding board member. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he was. Yeah. And I, actually I, I paid a little tribute to him and oh, yeah, yeah. Luckily I, I did remember to do that. Um, but yeah, he was a very active member. Um, and Becky and Rich, the Demun uh, little family picnic, was. did we report on that last time or has that happened since then? I couldn't find it on my calendar, but it no, was great. Yeah, you're right. That would have been since our last meeting. So thanks for remembering that, the High Point Neighborhood Associations. Yeah. Uh, like block party, yeah. It was, it was cool because there were people, you know, residents from the city of St. Louis and, you know, Clayton, and it was nice to see everyone mingling and by and large, everyone was talking about the same sort of issues and um, there was no dividing line there. It was one neighborhood and, and it, it, was, it was nice to see, that, which reminds me, I did uh, attend a meeting with the Muni League board, well, the executive team, and uh, Mayor Jones of the city of St. Louis. And we are now meeting monthly to just give ourselves updates and talk about issues and find out where we can collaborate. So I view that as a really good thing. That's a new thing. And um, it, was, it was, a I thought a really productive meeting. Um, lastly, I just wanna say, oh, I use up all my good material at your party, Janet, but I, but I just do wanna reiterate how, uh, how wonderful it's been to have you as our finance director, how much you've contributed all along the way in terms of um, training several mayors and a couple of city managers and been a city manager yourself here and before and um, also uh, educating all of us aldermen, making sure we understand, you know, the most important thing really, our financial status. Um, just. It's just been a great, a great relationship. And uh, we wish you all the best. And you can have more time to run around after those five grandkids and spend time in Florida. And so we'll be picturing you there in your happy place surrounded by your grandkiddos. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done for the city of Clayton. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Janet, I think you should come to Mugs with us one of these days. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll see you there someday. Okay. <laughs> all righty. Um, all right, everyone, That I think that concludes things. So that's all. Um, we'll say good night.
Hey, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. See some of you shortly. <laughs>